Welcome to um, Ozstocks tonight, everybody. Um, this session is called um, Dream Camera or Camera Dreaming Still Moving. Um, I'd like to um, first of all thank the um, sponsors of uh, Ozstocks, um, Screen New South Wales, uh, the ADG, and Afters. And, um, and I would also like to thank very much the um, um, uh, suppliers of equipment who have um, very kindly furnished um, this handsome array of, um, of equipment that we're looking at here tonight. So um, Ari, Canon, Sony and Blackmagic. Um, did I miss anybody out? No. Um, and we've got, a, uh, we've got a little interloper here on the table down the front as well um, from um, uh, Pana, uh, Panasonic. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen tonight is um, we've got um, guest speakers. We've got um, uh, Michael Latham and Ben Allen and we've got Peter DeVries. Peter DeVries um, sends his apologies. He's actually not in the room tonight but, um, but he will be with us um, virtually. And, um, and I have apologies from John Brawley and from Peter Coleman, um, both of whom were unable to make, the no uh, make tonight as well. So um, thank you very much, um, Ben and Michael, for joining us in their stead. And if you'd like to take a seat here, you're more than welcome. You don't have to keep standing over there. Um, so so it's, uh, we'll hear from, um, from both from Ben and from Michael um, and from Peter DeVries about the cameras that they've been working with and some of their experiences with them, what's been good, what's been fantastic and what they've had to work around. Um, and... Um, We'll screen clips, um, but um, we've also got in the room, and I would like to um, introduce to you um, our, um, our people from Canon, Ari and Sonny. So um, we've got um, we've got Paul Stewart from Canon, um, we've got uh, Stefan Settlemeyer from Ari Australia, um, we have Nick Bushner from Sonny, and Sean Elwood from Sonny. And um, um, they've all brought the equipment, but they're here also to participate in, um, in the Q&A when we get to the Q&A. What I want to start off with is um, the... Uh, let me see, can I make this work? I'll just go to... It's a very new device and I just have to have a go. Let's see if I can get this to work. OK. Blackboard. Yay! <laughs> it's a triangle. Um, cheap, fast and good. These are the three things that we all want on buildings, cameras, and um, get rid of that. Cheap, fast, and good. Okay, so it's a. I should have been a doctor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's the perennial triangle. We want all three things, and um, and the question is, are we actually able to have all three things in our cameras these days? So when I started thinking about this um, this dream camera, um, the um, and the the thing about it being cheap, um, I think everyone's definition of what cheap is will be um, individual to you as a human being, as a filmmaker, as a producer, and and I would also venture to say um, also probably by your age, because I've noticed that younger people like things to be extremely cheap. And I've noticed that older folk sort of accept that, you know, very high quality things sometimes cost quite a lot of money. So sometimes I find there's a bit of a difference there. Anyway, that's a very broad generalisation. Um, so when I was thinking about it, I went, well, um, in my mind, there's sort of three levels of um, categorisation of, um, of price bracket. And they're, they're, they're a little bit random, but basically I went, over 50,000, yep, that's a seriously expensive camera. And when I say camera, I mean the whole kit. I don't just mean the camera body, I mean everything that you need for the kit to work. Um, and below 15,000 is, in my opinion, a pretty cheap kit. If you've got a fully functional video camera that does all the things that you want it to do, all the lenses that you want, all the batteries that you need, the road cases, etc., 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 for under $15,000, and it's a good camera, it's a cheap camera. And then in between is the middle bracket. So between 15 and, uh, and 50, I would argue, is the, um, is the mid bracket, the mid range. Um, so then, so that's the easy part, sort of thinking about sort of. And I'm talking, I'm here I'm talking to you who are, thinking, who are thinking about buying a camera because, of course, we want a really, we want a bargain. We want the best camera at the best price. 
Um, so, um, so you have to decide what your um, budget is, basically. Um, so good. What's good in a good camera? What makes a good camera good? Um, when I was thinking about it, I, I decided that really it was about the quality of the recorded output. So um, it's about what you get from the camera. So that's the resolution of the image, and that arises from both the size and quality of the sensor and the image processor, the invisible black box inside every camera that's unique to the manufacturer, and we never get to see it and we can't control it, but it affects the calibre of, um, of the actual recorded image. Um, we want a camera that's got great dynamic range that will function in, um, in extreme light conditions and record detail in the highlights and the shadows. We want a camera that will give um, beautiful colour rendition, that will just make the skin tones look good because at the end of the day we're looking at people and we want them to look good. Of course we want a camera that will do at least 50 frames a second and preferably 120. That would be good because um, high speed is very, very useful. And we want a camera that has got a very robust editable codec. So, um, so a codec that will, um, that's when it goes into um, the editing system, um, will hold together and not fall apart. Um, lenses. Len Every camera will have, um, all the cameras that we're talking about now um, are all, um, you option them, you put the lenses on them that you want. So, um, so lens options is, um, is kind of like a separate little category that for me sits in both good and fast. Um, yeah. So <coughs> broadly speaking, they're the kind of like the headline areas for, um, for um, a good quality um, recording. And then when I was thinking about fast, I thought, okay, the camera has to be fast to actually work with. You want to be able to pick it up out of the box, possibly. You want to be able to pick it up out of the box and start shooting straight away. Put a battery on it and start shooting. That's a very fast camera if you can do that. Um, but the thing for me with, the, with all of the cameras that we're dealing with in this, um, definitely, where are we now? Is it three years since the 5D hit the ground? I think it's about three years. Maybe a little bit longer. Anyway, this is, by the way, the third um, Ausdox event which has looked specifically at cameras um, in this era of um, large sensor cameras and DSLRs. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we all know is that the, the battle with the, uh, with the cameras in the beginning of the DSLRs was the ergonomics was absolute shite. Um, they were really hard to work with and they required a lot of bracketry and a lot of building to actually get them to, um, to be functional. But... Um, <clears throat> um, they did it on the um, on the closing episode of uh, of House. Um, they shot. They used those five Ds, um, and probably all of the focus pullers on on that show all had nervous breakdowns on that show because they were working with lenses that didn't actually have stops. You know, the focus just kept on turning. It didn't actually stop. Um, they weren't familiar with them. They were really hard to work with. The ergonomics were terrible. So a fast camera is one that's got good ergonomics good ergonom ergonomic design. The other really important thing on, uh, on any camera that's going to be fast to work with is um, it's going to have a good viewfinder and monitoring system. So you can actually trust what you're seeing in the viewfinder um, and you can judge the quality of what you're looking at. Um, it's going to have a really good menu layout. Who's sick of bad menu layouts? Yes. Um, so menu, menu design is... Um, is incredibly important in this era where we're all specialists in reading menus. Um, it's going to have low light sensitivity, so um, um, we're going to have a look at um, one of the cameras here tonight which has got extraordinary low light sensitivity. Um, and it's going to have really good monitoring for exposure, focus and um, audio level. When you're shooting documentary, you have to be able to control and, and monitor your audio level. And if you have to go through three layers of the menu to actually get to it or you can't get to it at all, that's a bad thing. Um, and it's going to have um, a lot of capacity for, uh, for recording. It's going to have huge capacity for recording. That means you can shoot for you know, five hours without stopping. Um, that was a joke. In case anybody, you know, my friend Denise Haslam, who says when asked, you know, sort of what camera is a good camera, one with a big off button. She says, <laughs> so people stop. <laughs> um, and again, um, to, for it to qualify as being fast, it's going to have. Um, you'll have chosen um, a lens which gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in how you work and how you go about shooting. 
So that's my sort of very simple um, but headline idea about how to think about your cameras and what they can give you. Um, and if you can find a camera that gives you, um, that ticks a lot of boxes in all of those and it's at a price that works for you, then um, you're going to be a very happy customer. All right, so um, um, what we're going to do now is because it is an absolutely gorgeous full moon happening tonight, we're all going to leave the theatre and go and look at the full moon. No, we're not. OK. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to watch a, um, a short film, um, which is filmed entirely in Moonlight, and I expect that quite a few of you will have seen it already. Um, it's called Moonlight, and um, it was filmed on the tiniest camera in the room, which actually happens to have the biggest sensor on it, the Sony A7S. Um, ben, would you mind just picking it up? Sony A7S, Exhibit A. OK, this was the camera that was used to, uh, to shoot Moonlight. I thought it was very appropriate that we have a full moon tonight and that that was filmed one month ago on the full moon in September. So it was generally shot at either 25,600 ISO or 32,000 ISO. Um, it's, um, it's not graded, there's been no noise, noise reduction or sharpness added and it's just come as the clip straight out of the camera um, as they were shot in, um, in the picture profile number two. Hard work for the focus puller, I think, because um, of course it was pitch black. Like when you actually see the stills of the shoot that are on, um, on the Vimeo site, it's very dark. You can't see anything in the stills. No, so, yeah, they, um, they used a couple of Zeiss lenses, a 55, uh, 1.4, and a 28, 2. So, that's it. Cool. All right, um, so before we move to our guests who are in the room, we're going to go to um, Peter de Vries. Um, Peter, uh, I, I wanted um, Peter to talk about the A7S because he's recently worked with it um, in, in shooting a, um, uh, a promo, like a, a trailer for a film um, in the States and um, so he was working solo, there was no money um, and um, he had to take stills as well as do video 
um, and he had no lights, there was no assistant, so it was just, just him and the camera and the director and, um, and the microphone. And um, so it was, um, it was a, a very, very compact kit and uh, he, um, you'll see it in, in this one, so he'll, he'll talk about his experience working with it. Uh, Erica, this is the Sony A7S and it's a camera that I used recently. Um, I chose it for a very specific reason uh, and the reason is it's a very small camera. Let's just have a look at, let's go back from there and kind of work out where, where this camera ends and where it starts. The beautiful thing about this camera is it is, it is so small and it is so light. Uh, it very much suited the job I was doing, which was um, working with um, Lisa Iceman on a, a production called Women in Blues. It's like most DSLRs. It is, in fact, a mirrorless system, a mirrorless camera, but it's optimised for video. This is one of the first of the generation of stills cameras that have actually been optimised, I would say, it's sort of been skewed towards shooting video rather than stills, although it's very good at both. The thing is, it's still a stills. It's still a stills camera. That's the that's the bad news. So it's ergonomically not right. It's uh, you know it's everything that that a video camera shouldn't be in many respects. But the thing I found with this one is that because it is so small, it's actually very easy to to make it work well as a as a video camera. Now the great news about this camera is that, uh, and this is uh, with mirrorless systems, is that you can actually, uh, as well as having an image. Uh, on the back, which you can't see at the moment because it's being uh, it's up here. Um, the reason why uh, this is actually so so good is because um, I can actually look through the viewfinder because I have the same image that is that is displayed here and here will also be displayed in the viewfinder. Now the thing about that is you can just pick the camera up out of the box put it into video mode and actually start shooting video just with your eye up here. You've got zebra, you've got uh, focus peaking, all the kind of video tools that, that we're used to are all available on this camera. They're all built in. You don't have to hack the software. You don't have to download anything and install it. It's all ready to go. So the beautiful thing about the camera, first of all, without th these, these um, peripherals that I've put on here, is that I can actually just pick this camera up without this stuff and actually start shooting video like this. Take my eye away, I get my image back here and I can do handheld work but as soon as focus becomes critical I can get in here and actually focus extremely ac accurately. So it's, there's so many advantages to having, uh, to being able to look through a viewfinder because you, you, you know, you're, you, especially when you're working on bright sunny days uh, it'd be impossible to use the back so you can actually go straight here. So for me it, it was, you know, answered a lot of the uh, wishes that I had for a D DSLR style camera. The beautiful thing about this camera is that because it is a mirrorless system, no mirror, that means the actual chamber um, is very, very um, thin, very not very thick, because it, it doesn't have to have a, a whole chamber here, if you like, for the, for the shutter mechanism to work. The shutter is, is, is completely superfluous in, in, in video, um, in, in DSLR photography. So by having this actual short distance allows other manufacturers to provide uh, adapters, a company called like Metabones, that's a very popular one, that allows us to put Canon EF lenses on this camera and that's, that's a, a great advantage. You can use any, virtually any lenses that you have can be used on this camera with a reasonably inexp inexpensive spacer or um, a lens, a lens mount adapter. In terms of specifications, it's a large sensor camera. Um, and the beautiful thing about what, what Sony have managed to do with this camera is to actually utilize for video the full sensor, that is the full um, size of the sensor. It doesn't skip lines, uh, it doesn't pixel bin, it, it uses the whole sensor. And that's, that's actually quite significant because this gets rid of aliasing. It won't fix the um, globe, the um, the jelly wobbles or the, um, what do you call it, I can't rolling remember, shutter. rolling shutter issues, mm -hmm. they, they are still here but somewhat reduced. Um, but it's, um, it's amazing quality because it's using the full size sensor. And um, the other extraordinary thing is that it's, um, it's sensitivity, everyone's probably quite familiar with the A7S, 
uh, being very, very popular because it has ridiculously high ISO settings. Um, I've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of stills work on this camera when I was in um, New Orleans. I was shooting at 40,000 ISO and it just looked like 3,000 ISO on, a, on another camera. It, it's incredible. Um, what, you, what you can do. And this is very helpful in stills because you can select very high shutter speeds and, um, and, still, and get very, very sharp shots. My, my ratio of, of in-focus shots for stills photography has, has gone through the roof now because I can actually shoot in dark conditions, um, say stage performances, at a thousandth of a second, utilising 40,000 ISO. So this also translates well into video mode as well because you're having, uh, obviously, you can shoot in the most ridiculously low available light situations. And I probably should explain why that's possible. Why, why, why is this camera capable of shooting in, in these very, very low light conditions and bringing out images without any noticeable grain, which is what it, what it effectively does? The reason being is that, that Sony, with this particular camera, because they they um, re-looked at video and thought, well, look, we don't need a 36 megapixel um, sensor uh, like in the A7R, which is the, um, another model that I use for, for higher resolution stills photography. This also shoots video, but this camera is the one that they have thought to optimise video on. on the, this is the A7S, optimised for video. Um, this is a 36 megapixel uh, sensor, so there's a lot of pixel sites on, that, on this chip. They actually decided to make the, uh, the number of pixels on this sensor only 12 megapixel, which, which is kind of, you know, when you look at the pixel race, it looks like it's going backwards. You think, well, why would you, why would you only shoot, why would you buy a camera with only 12 megapixels instead of 36? Surely more is better. Uh, in the case of video, we simply don't need 36 megapixels to, to make 4K images. There is enough pixels um, in, a 12, in, a, in a 12 megapixel sensor to be able to create beautiful, beautiful pictures, and especially video images. And so um, you don't have to downsample, you don't have to do any tricks, you can use the full size sensor. Each of the pixel sites um, in, on this sensor are in fact very large. They're much larger than, say, the pixels on here. So it's not quite as crowded here, if you like. And so each sensor or each, each photo site actually has a lovely little bit of space around it. It's just like, like people camping in a campsite. You get everybody um, on, on a small sensor. You have everybody crammed into a, um, um, into a, um, a camping site and they've all got their fires on at night and they're, they're roasting their marshmallows but the people next door are saying, look, do you mind putting your fire out? We can't sleep because the light from your fire is keeping us awake. And, you know, people want to go to the dunny so they've got to sort of shuffle. Anyway, you get the idea. You've got less pixels and so each pixel has its own space around it which gives it a lot more comfort and integrity. There is no spillage and leakage of light to the next pixel site, photo site. And, and that's what, uh, that in, in, in turn enables this camera to shoot at these extraordinarily high ISOs, um, ratings, or yeah, ratings, because it is, each, as you get higher, it is not contaminating the tent next door. So it does its own thing. It also, it, it, it actually, um, if you think about less pixels, you might think, well, there's all these gaps. But in fact, on this sensor, they use uh, some sort of gap bridging technology. I, I know nothing about it, but apparently it, it, it somehow manages to merge all the pixels. There is no, you don't see sort of patches of dots everywhere. In fact, this is a dot-free zone. This is a grain-free zone up to around about 40,000 ISO. Thank you, Pete. I'd now like to introduce Ben Allen to you. Ben is, um, is incredibly experienced and um, working, has worked right across um, um, documentary, drama, features, television and TVCs and has also um, um, created his own grading suite, which um, I didn't actually realise until I read your website and kind of <laughs> went, my goodness me, um, which is um, an incredibly useful grading tool. So, um, um, Ben Allen. Yeah, so um, if I can possibly pick up where Pete's left off there. 
Um, I've also done some some testing with the the A7S, and it's it's really quite amazing um, what they've packed into that little camera. Um, and I guess the way I would describe what Pete was describing there with the pixels is basically because um, there's so relatively few pixels compared to the A7R um, in the same area, those pixels are bigger and so more light falls on each one of them. Basically as simple as that. that um, um, which is why large sensor cameras tend to be very good in low light um, because they, they're, they're pixels for the same resolution or for the same, yeah, for the same resolution are um, proportionally bigger. Um, so the, there had already, by the time I did some tests with it, there had already been a lot written and shot about the, the low light capabilities of the camera. So I was, I was a little bit interested in kind of seeing that for myself, but more interested because I, um, I color grade um, most of what I shoot and have done for, um, for quite a few years now. Um, I was really interested to see how the camera would perform in terms of um, how malleable the pictures were in the color grade and how they would stand up to look up tables and, um, and over and under exposure correction. Um, it's usually one of the first things I want to know about a new camera. Um, one of the things that's very exciting about the A7S uh, from my point of view is that it shoots S-Log. Um, how many of you would say you're, you're um, confident with the concept of log recording? Okay, cool. That's great. So the, the really flat, com compressed in terms of dynamic range uh, images from the S-Log recordings, that um, it's the same color space that's used on all the, the high-end Sony cameras and basically all of the high-end um, digital cinema cameras uh, from all the different manufacturers have some version of log recording. Uh, and so to have S-Log on something this size and with that low light and the, the large sensor, I mean, the, the full-frame uh, DSLR-style si sensor I mean, um, stills photographers think of that as as 35 millimeter, um, but in motion picture terms, it's what used to be called VistaVision 8 perf because stills and VistaVision runs horizontally through the camera, whereas motion picture film generally, what we think of as 35 mil, runs vertically. So, um, so it's it's a in motion picture terms, it's a very very big sensor like the 5D sensors. Um, so I shot a little test, um, very kind of anecdotal test, um, just to see, uh, basically, as I'll explain, there's a voice track recorded. Um, what you'll see is, this is a, just a screen capture from DaVinci Resolve, literally as I was playing with the footage and just talking about it as, as I saw it. Um, but the, the idea was to test the ISO calibration, um, but then it's kind of turned into a crazy uh, latitude test. This is a little test that I did uh, to look at the relationship between light meter readings and the ISO ratings um, in the A7S, just to see if they still correlate at these really high ASA, ISO levels that the A7S is capable of. Um, so this was shot uh, S-Log2, just with the um, LCA lookup table applied, um, and shot uh, on the 24 to 70 millimeter uh, Zeiss lens, which is wide open at f4. Um, so at f4, uh, I'm at 160,000 ASA uh, to get this exposure. Um, and looking at that there, I think that's a really good base exposure to start grading from. So in answer to that original question, um, I, I think they do still correlate very accurately. Um, something that's a little bit surprising, given that this is a highly compressed 8-bit recording, um, is I would expect to be seeing uh, some banding um, and significant blocking um, occurring in um, these kind of mid-grey areas of the, the car there. I'm not seeing any of that um, on, on screen um, with the lookup table applied. What really surprised me though is uh, when, when I panned around to here. Now that driveway is on an incident reading in the middle of the driveway about six stops overexposed, uh, which I would expect on any camera like this to be irretrievable. Um, 
but just pulling that back with the printer light control only um, on, on Resolve 11 here, you can see that when we pull that back about six stops, um, we end up with something that's pretty watchable. Um, some blown out highlights there, um, which are way, way over. Um, but that's basically a pretty, pretty watchable um, recording there at six stops over. We can even pull a little bit more detail out of those shadows just using the lift control there. Um, and it's quite malleable. It's kind of behaving a lot more like film than I would have expected um, from a camera anywhere near this sort of range. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend uh, going out and shooting stuff six stops over and expecting it to work without some pretty thorough testing because this is very particular circumstance. I don't know whether this would still hold true at lower ISO ratings. Um, it certainly makes sense that the camera is seeing a lot more detail in the highlights as you increase the ISO. Um, but it's still really surprising that you're able to retrieve that from such a compressed format, um, particularly in 8-bit. Um, so pretty impressive all round. As I said, I certainly wouldn't recommend shooting anything six stops over and expecting it to come back um, like that. I'd, I'd want to do a whole lot more testing before taking that kind of risk. <coughs> and also part of the beauty of the log recording is that uh, you, you do have all that, that latitude. <coughs> so if you're working right to the edge of that, um, then you don't have that safety net there. Um, a few other factors that were involved there is because um, <coughs> there were no skin tones in that, so I'm not sure that a skin tone would have come back as well as that brick wall did. Um, all the same, I was, I was quite surprised, and what that says to me is that um, <coughs> the S-Log in the A7S is very much genuine S-Log there, and it's capturing this huge dynamic range in a really flat recording, and then... Um, when you put the lookup tables on that, if it's exposed correctly um, for the, the ISO rating, it, it comes up beautifully straight away. Did you... Um, oh, I'll ask this. Um, did you try <coughs> any tests with the external recorder? No, Samos? no, not yet. And that gives you a, a higher <coughs> bit depth? Yeah, so... <coughs> um, the... The internal recording on the, the A7S is um, <coughs> a variant of Sony's XAVC. It's the XAVC-S, which is the consumer um, sort of version of it. Um, and it's, uh, it's 50 megabits a second, is that right, Nick? Yeah. So it's, which still qualifies, say, with the BBC as broadcast quality, um, but it's significantly lower data rate than the, um, the, the Pro XAVC, which is... Um, in HD, about 100, 110, 120. Um, and, but the big difference is um, on the <coughs> XAVC-S, uh, it, it's an 8-bit recording, and on the, the Pro XAVC, it's 10-bit. And that's significant because the way the, the binary bits work is 10-bit gives you four times as much tonal subtlety in each of the colour channels as 8-bit. And so when you are working with the, um, the, the flat recordings of the S-Log, um, while you do have that latitude there, you may lose quite a bit of tonal subtlety if you get too close to the edges of that. So, um, I mean, the, um, the, the A7S is, uh, is quite remarkable. It's, um, it's, the design of it is, um, is so... Physically compact, but so um, highly specced. It's um, it's a, it is a, it's an extraordinary package, um, and I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about it. Um, but perhaps I can just ask you to talk about the um, the other very new camera in the room, the um, the FS7. Yeah. Because you've done some testing with that as well. Yeah. So I've I've just done some testing with the um, the pre-production FS7 that's over there. Um, and it's a really interesting camera as well because um, Sony have obviously been listening to people saying we want something that's ergonomically a bit better than um, than either you know a DSLR style thing or a you know, the brick kind of 
cameras that um, have kind of evolved post um, red influence. Um, even though red's still out there, of course, but um, uh, after their influence on camera design, so many of the, the cameras have gone to this kind of um, Pete calls it the shoebox design, and um, so it's, I, I'm really pleased that Sony have been listening to people going, well, we, we need a camera that you know looks and feels like a camera, and um, their their answer to that is the FS7, and um, again, very highly specced. Um, it's a bigger unit than the A7S, of course, but still quite compact. It's really pretty easy to um, to carry around. I, I was shooting for several hours with it handheld, with with no assistant, and uh, and had no no problems at all. Um, and it also it does uh, this does S log two. Um, the FS7 does S log two and S log three, um, and um, uh, S-Log3 is just a, another variation on that, that um, low contrast recording to get the big dynamic range. Um, but it records in the, the Pro XAVC format. And as well as HD, it does, um, at the moment, um, UHD, which a lot of people will call 4K, um, it, which is essentially a 16 by 9 4K image. Um, uh, the same as what this will record in 4K mode. What's going to be added to it later is um, true, you know, one eight nine to one aspect ratio, four K, um, for you know, four thousand ninety six pixels across. Um, in HD, it does slow mo um, in the NTSC world up to one hundred eighty frames a second. In the um, twenty five frame base frame rate world, it does up to one hundred fifty frames a second, which is still, I think, pretty good for most situations, um, and really good functionality in terms of you know audio and all that sort of stuff so what we wanted to do with this <coughs> um, was test it out on a realistic kind of project for what it's designed for so um, I literally had the camera for about an hour and a half before we started shooting this video um, and it was all shot over <coughs> um, a weekend in a couple of short bursts and so we wanted to do an interview in a, a, a typical kind of tricky situation, interior, low ceilings, that sort of thing. <coughs> and then um, some uh, slow motion beauty stuff and then some following the action handheld stuff as well. And so this is, um, this is a little short piece about cheese. I tell people I'm a cheesemonger or you know on the birth certificates of my three children writing the mother's occupation is cheesemonger you certainly get some funny um, some funny looks and then questions and then the cheese stories everyone's got a cheese story my relationship with cheese is not just my livelihood for the last 12 years my world has been consumed by cheese when I provide people with cheese. I see and I hear the sounds that come out of people. They usually draw breath, it's like <sighs> There's a cheese for everyone. A lot of judges place as great an emphasis on the visual assessment and the smelling as they do the tasting. Unlike wine, whiskey and beer, you can actually judge a cheese by its cover. You can look at a cheese and take a pretty good educated guess as to perhaps what milk type the cheese is from. You know, all milk looks white, but it's the milk nutrients in cow's milk that are coloured yellow. So if you're seeing a, a bright yellow cheese, pretty good guess is it's going to be a cow's milk cheese. And then we can look at the characteristics of the cheese, the texture, perhaps if it has a rind or not, what type of rind, how hard the cheese is, and we can identify which of the seven families of cheese it is from. In terms of accompaniments, yes, wine is the most romantic pairing, but actually, it's champagne and beer that are the most correct, the most similar in terms of the science and history, how they ferment. The effervescence of beer just cuts through the creaminess of the cheese and, and lifts your palate. It doesn't compete. The more you know about cheese, the more you realise you don't know. Cheddar should never develop a rind. It's the cloth that goes mouldy over that long maturation, that cellaring period. 
Cashel blue is to the Irish what Stilton is to the English. It is their national blue. Hard cheeses, Pyrenean sheep cheese. Fresh cheeses often get overlooked. With wine, we tend to ask questions about the wine that's on our dinner table. What vintage, where it's from, you know, the grape varietal, who was the winemaker, the brand. If we could only place as much emphasis on our cheeses, I think people would be far more engaged in the cheese world. How to win friends and influence people? Cheese. Yeah, so that was graded in DaVinci Resolve with um, uh, the, the lookup table applied uh, as a node, the final node on each, each shot. Um, uh, the reason for that was I wanted to use a different lookup table on the interview stuff to the other, the cheese footage. Um, I forget which one it was I used on the interview stuff, but I just, it was a trial and error thing. I found it looked quite good as a starting point for the, um, the interview footage. Um, uh, the... The lenses were, most of it was shot on the, um, uh, is that the, the one that's on there? The, yeah, yeah, 24 to 70 um, Zeiss full frame stills lens. Uh, the same one I used on the, uh, the A7S tests. Um, I, I haven't done a lot of work with stills lenses on video. Um, and so on the interview stuff, you might have noticed as she leaned forward, the focus was going in and out a bit. That was basically, we were shooting that with a, um, a Canon 50mm through the Metabones, not a speed booster, just a standard Metabones adapter. Um, and uh, that was basically me going, okay, I've got that much depth of field, I'm not even going to try and pull focus on this. Um, uh, we had very limited time to shoot that interview. Um, and so um, the, the rest of it was, um, it was all shot HD, um, except for a few shots, um, like the, the oozing cheese shot. Um, we were at minimum focus on that, so, and um, we wanted to get closer, so we just switched to 4K, um, and it effectively halved our minimum focus distance, and we were able to get quite close on that. So that's what you're seeing on that shot is the 4K pixel for pixel, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, cropped in, a 200% enlargement of it. Um, and uh, what else? Um, any questions about that, about how we did that? Yeah. How did you like the interview? Uh, that was just a, a couple of um, Lowell um, tungsten lights, really basic lightweight documentary style kit, old school. The yeah. How did you find the highlight roll-off? I, I, well, the the highlight roll-off I find on all the the Sony cameras with the A, uh, with, sorry with the S log um, gamma curve um, it is very consistent. Um, and what I usually do, uh, I was talking about this with Nick earlier. I usually use um, one of the lookup tables on the output side um, in Resolve, and then just introduce a little bit more of a curve um, into the highlights. Uh, using the, the, the curve tool on an earlier node um, just to roll that off a little bit more. Um, I think the, um, the lookup tables um, for the S-Log to Rec. 709 tend to be very technical um, in, in, to my eye. And so um, certainly with that, we decided to go for something that was a bit kind of, uh, of a gentler sort of curve on most of it. Um, yeah, a little bit more rustic. Um, I couldn't figure out how to format the cards. Um, <laughs> and so I shot the whole thing on the, the 264s. Um, and um, uh, they seem, seem to work fine. They seem to work quite well. The, um, uh, you know, the XAVC in 4K is, is churning through a fair bit of data. Um, and they, they handled that very easily. Um, especially at later on. Also the slow-mo. Um, 150 frames in HD is, again, a fair bit of data rate, and they seem to be fine. How did you find, obviously you said that you couldn't figure out how to format it. Does that mean the menu system is quite complicated? The menu system is, is very similar to the other, like the F5, F55 menus. Um, I think that's a prototype issue, I'm, I'm assuming. Well, we did you get... We did it after you. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay. Um, but yeah, the menu system, for anyone who's familiar with the Sony menu systems, um, it, it's like, I, I took one look at it and went, yep, that makes sense. Set it to S-Log, blah, 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 blah. The, the only thing I, I would throw in there about RAW, um, and Nick's heard me to talk about this many times, um, is RAW is fantastic, um, but it's, to me, it's essentially being able to, in the color grade, change your camera settings. Um, so in a lot of situations, like if you know how to set up the camera, how to set your exposures, um, and your white balance the way you want them, um, it can be overkill for a lot of projects. So it's something that um, I kind of I think through quite carefully on each project, whether it's necessary. Um, and codecs like the XAVC and ProRes codecs that, um, that are 10-bit, that do give you a lot of latitude to, to work within the range of the, the sensor um, and do quite big corrections there. Um, so that 10-bit that issue, I think, in, in many ways is, is quite a, a big one that those codecs solve quite well. Yeah, I, the, the thing that I mainly shoot, not raw, but I a lot of the time do wish I did because especially when you're shooting documentary style stuff and you're moving between lighting conditions and mm -hmm. you go from a warm light to a cold light to these, they're really hard to grade out when you're going from extremes mm -hmm. and raw enables you just to shift it like that. And there's no issues. That, is, basic, a, that is a very good example of where raw so does work. Yeah. The film that I shot um, on 5d Ukraine is not a brothel. Um, we had a lot of issues grading that footage and you'll probably, you probably see it in the footage, but, um, and that, that is a, it's partly a camera settings thing and it's partly like you start with one look and then you end up with another. So, um, in, in terms of documentary, it's probably pretty impractical a lot of the time because it's huge data rates. I don't know what you're looking at, but I think was it 512 gigabytes gives you an hour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're shooting Half a terabyte Kitty's film hour. shot 700 hours. So that's like, I don't know, that's huge amounts, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but if you were doing like a stylized visual sequence or something and you really wanted to do a high end production, it's worth thinking about. And for me, I, I shoot, I shoot documentaries, but I also do like you do as well, uh, commercial work. And in that sense, you want it to look as pretty as possible. And raw is going to give you that. The other thing I guess in a commercial situation, um, with raw is if you're shooting a particular look that's been agreed on in advance and the client or ad agency, um, decides to change that in post-production, you've got a lot more scope for that with raw. Um, you can make drastic changes to the image, um, and, and still, you know, have a lot of latitude there. Um, but, um, from my point of view, there's, uh, on not all projects, but on a lot of projects, I'm prepared to make quite a few compromises, um, to like, for example, shooting, um, XAVC or ProRes rather than RAW, simply to not have to do data wrangling on location while you're shooting. Um, I think to be able to get through a whole day of shooting without having to offload and format cards, um, I think just removes such a big risk factor from shooting. Um, and it, it also allows you to work very, very quickly. Um, that, that's just my approach. Well, what we might do next is, um, is just to hear a little bit more from, from you, Michael, um, Michael Latham, um, who shot Ukraine is Not a Brothel, um, and um, um, which was shot mainly on the 5D, which is notorious for um, the difficulty of, of grading um, afterwards. Yeah, it's a pretty unforgiving camera. Um, mm. I was really surprised with the A7S footage. Like, if we had had that, that would have saved my behind a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, pretty much if you do what he did then on the 5D, it's not coming back. It's gone. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've, I'm, I'm in a weird world where I kind of shoot 5D and then I shoot Alexa. So you're kind of a $2,000 camera or I'm shooting a $100,000 camera. Um, 
And so I haven't shot with these other cameras. I'm interested in the FS7 because it's kind of a possible middle ground. Um, so with Ukraine is not a brothel, I was there on a tourist visa. Kitty was there on a spouse visa. We were in Ukraine, obviously. Um, so we're not really meant to be there. We're shooting politically sensitive things and we're foreigners. So I did have a rig for a 5D and Kitty said, we're not going to shoot that. So we just shot a standard zoom lens, which is like a, was a 24 to 105 image stabilized lens. And we just had a little microphone on the top and that was our kit. You know, we we're going incognito as possible. And so when I think about, I was just thinking about the cameras and I was like, well, this is, this, this is what I'd shoot that on again. You know, if I had a second chance, because it's kind of like the new 5D basically, you know, and it gives you the ability to not look like a filmmaker, which is important in a lot of, a lot of circumstances. Something I'd throw in there that Pete touched on is the fact that unlike an SLR, um, because it's a mirrorless camera, you can actually look through the viewfinder when you're shooting. And that does two things. It makes you less conspicuous, because it looks like you're just taking photos, um, but it also helps you stabilise the camera. I was amazed at how stable the pictures were when I was shooting with my eye up to the viewfinder, because you, your head is naturally stabilised. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's a, quite a, an interesting feature. Yeah, and the other thing is when you're traveling a lot, you don't want to be lugging cases and there's all these considerations. Um, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I think it depends on the project as to what camera you're going to use. Uh, everything has a valid point. If you give me a lot of money, I'm going to choose the Amira. But that's a uh, starting price at 40 50 and you know the FS7 is a starting price of somewhere around eight. It's not, it's not confirmed nine and a half. So you know it's five times the price. Um, Sony's going to argue that it's not five times the quality, and <laughs> uh, Ari's going to argue that it is. Um, I for me the Amira. I so I have two clips. I don't know if we want to watch them or not. Um, okay, so the. Well, I have three actually. So there's two <laughs> of Ukraine is not a brothel, and uh, they're, they're just the more cinematic clips. I just chose them based on everybody's seen interviews, so I thought, well, we'll just watch something that's kind of pretty pictures. Um, and then the other one is Tao Suru, which is not a documentary, but in many ways it was shot like a documentary that it's non actors. We didn't really have much control of the location, we're running around. And that was shot on the Alexa, which is basically the Amira. You know, the Amira is the documentary version of the Alexa. Um, and so that's two extremes. You'll see that, you know, it's kind of hard to judge video quality because I basically just came straight off a shoot and I just grabbed, these are like Vimeo grabs. So they're gonna be quite compressed and not really good representation of the cameras, but um, you get an idea nonetheless. Um, okay. So this is 5D. Нам подзвонив наш юрист Денис і сказав про те, що відкриті кримінальні справи на активісток, які приймали участь на дзвіниці Софійського собору. Я в шоці. Я тільки що задумалась про те, що зараз, в найближчий час, я не можу виходити на протести. Тому що, якщо я вийду на протест, то мене заарештують. Я можу опинитися у в'язниці не на декілька днів, як раніше це могло статися, чого я не боюся. Я можу опинитися у в'язниці на рік, на півроку, на п'ять років. One, two, three, four. Як буде зайць по-англійськи? I rabbit. I fucking rabbit.
So that's a good idea of the highlights disappearing and not getting them back. You just have to work with the compromises. And so with that camera and shooting with the image stabilized lens and it's F4 and we didn't want to go above ISO 800. So like, you know, then most of the interior stuff is lit, you know, pretty much even in the car. When you're looking at her, she's lit. And that is, that's partly a restriction of the um, dynamic range that, you know, talking about this, this camera here and being able to get those highlights back. I had to put lights in to, to retain the highlights. Um, and, and so it, it was somewhat of a painful process, but you get quite a good image out of it if you do it right. So it's kind of, it's an interesting thing that I, I don't know if I'd go out and buy one of these without doing tests because Canon has quite a long history of getting the colors right. You know, and so this is something that I find interesting, and this is why I don't like shooting red. I don't, I don't shoot. Basically, if someone offers me a red, I'd rather shoot a 5D um, because of the colors. And so when you when you look at a look at tests and all the camera places, they put up like big landscapes, and that's great. But the majority of the time, we're looking at people and their skin. You know, and so if someone's skin looks a bit off, you start, like there's, there's something that just feels not natural about it. And so Canon has, has been very good at giving very beautiful skin tones. And so I haven't shot tests on the Sony. I would, that would be my main concern because the majority of the time you are, you're, you're filming people doing something, you're filming someone talking, you know, you have the beautiful landscape shots in between, but probably 60, 70% of your film is gonna be people in it. So it's something to really consider. If I could just throw in, um, I have a similar feeling about red. Um, and I know there are people who do get really beautiful skin tones out of the red cameras from the raw recording. Um, but they have to, to, to work it to get it to do that. And the people who've done a lot of that have some very good techniques for it. And I think that's one of the, the factors with, with all of these cameras is because we're getting to a point where they do have so much latitude and malleability in the images, that um, part of it is what they're capable of, but also part of it is what they tend towards and what you're describing with the Canon skin tones. Um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about there, where it, they, with very little manipulation, they fall very naturally. Yeah, and people look healthy. You know, some, some, like the red to me gives you an orange. It kind of looks like everybody got a fake tan, you know, and I know people do get good results, but for me, half the time, I wasn't there for, I was there for two days of the grade on Ukraine is not a brothel, and then I flew out. And so for me, I, I want a camera that's going to start somewhere good, and then you can build on that. So, uh, like the Alexa, naturally, oh sorry, that's the Amira, which is basically the Alexa, um, naturally has really great skin tones, has really good color reproduction. So I can give that to somebody and unless they're completely retarded, they're gonna get a good image. Like I don't have to stress about it. If I give someone a red file, I don't know what I'm gonna get, you know. Um, and I haven't, I haven't shot on these other cameras, so I, I don't really have much input into that. But if I was looking for a camera, I'd be looking at dynamic range and skin tones. I'm not a big fan of Canon skin tone because I find there's a bit more magenta to the colours. But I find, and I shoot with the Panasonic GH3s and the GH4s as well, and I shoot in more <coughs> events such as weddings and all that. And people are a bit more particular about skin tones than that especially the brides. Um, so they're more critical on that side. Um, and I'd say that the A7S has a much more natural skin tone. That basically means that you still need to play a bit with grading a bit, just add a bit more vibrancy. The dynamic range and the, the, the high ISO <coughs> gives so much more flexibility when you have very limited time to light. In fact, you can't even light half the time. You just shoot as you go. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would 
buy <coughs> another 5D. Like today, I bought mine a few years ago when this this wasn't out. I would be looking probably elsewhere. It it'd just depend on basically on the colors. Um, but the the other thing that so people ask why is the Amira, you know, so much more expensive? And to me, like I was just having this discussion, and we were mm. as well, about the highlight roll off. And what that means is when, when it gets too bright and the camera clips out and your sky goes to white or your clouds or whatever it is, <coughs> there's, you see it really on a 5D and you, you still see it on other cameras. It, the difference between where it's too bright and where the information is just there, on digital cameras it tends to give hard lines. And film has always had this very soft, diffused roll off which makes it look beautiful. So even when it goes to white, you're not like, oh, like there's something wrong with that. And the Alexa to me is the only camera that, uh, sorry, the Amira and the Alexa are the only cameras to me that emulate that roll off. And I know they do a, a special thing with the sensor that no other camera does. And so like I haven't shot with these other three cameras. Um, so I, I can't say, it 100% that they don't do a similar thing, but... Um, it's kind of, uh, I think in some ways it's also a little bit like the, the skin tone issue in that, like, I think any of these cameras, you could probably get some nice highlight roll off um, uh, if you were prepared to put a certain amount of time and effort into setting up the camera and then grading it a certain way. Um, whereas, as you say, with the Alexa Ramira cameras, that's there out of the box. It's kind of built in. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, it, it's that kind of thing of being able to get a good starting point with an image. You know, like the red, you can grade it till there's no tomorrow, but you also need enough money and a, a person that's uh, skilled enough to get that, you know. And when you're looking at color grading suites, you know, I know they can be a thousand dollars an hour, you know, that like you can get them cheaper, but like a high end color grading suite's a thousand dollars an hour, and you don't want to be spending that kind of money trying to squeeze out an image if you can uh, i haven't shot on the black magic but from what i understand the colors are very good but i i am skeptical of that camera because of its iso and this is talking about not having the time to light and being in these dark situations where the a7s um obviously is a huge advantage there so i don't know what this is rated at but the black magic the other one was it's, 300 it's, it's 800 yeah is it true 800 because I, I don't think so yeah so that's the thing that so the the previous model was 320 iso 320 iso and so most of these cameras i think would be at least 800 i know the amira is 800 i think they've stuck 800 on it to make you think that it's the same but from what i understand the other black magic <coughs> needed a lot of light to get a good image when you start getting into this lower exposure range you get all that noise it starts to look like it's raining in the blacks um, and you have to get a good exposure in there so if you're shooting in a dark indoors environment suddenly it's it's looking like your image is falling apart and so I think they've done amazing things with the color the color looks really great it looks really filmic I think that's the thing everybody wants a filmic image you don't want it to look like crappy TV you you want your your film to look like cinema um, and these are kind of the things you need to think about. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that's, that's we are in an era now where that is what we have with most of the cameras that are available <coughs> to us. Yeah, I, mm. I am quite opinionated about 4K. <laughs> I don't really believe it's necessary. You know, when you talk to, I, when I use the Alexa, I put diffusion filters in the front because I think it's too sharp. You know, film is very beautiful because it's it has a softness <coughs> to it that when you see someone's skin you don't see all the pot marks and you know the little blackheads and all this stuff that digital is giving you and so this push for sh sharp 4k images is actually just making things look uglier in my in my point of view and you, you hear these dps and they're putting they're just stacking in these diffusion filters and so your 4k image goes down to a 1k image because you're trying to soften it down to a point where people don't look ugly, you know? And the whole point is to get a beautiful image, not to get this razor sharp thing that you look at and you can see every detail. 
One of the other things that comes into play there that I've noticed with um, some of the digital cameras is how much kind of detail enhancement they do uh, within the camera. And that can usually be controlled to some extent in most of the cameras. Um, but some of them uh, in their default settings tend to do a lot of that. And so if you're looking for a sharp camera and you look at those cameras and you go, oh, wow, that's really sharp pictures, um, may not be more resolution, but it just kind of looks sharp, but may not be as kind to, to skin and faces. Um, whereas other cameras may have kind of less of that um, detail enhancement um, that gives it a kind of softer look while still having um, the actual resolution there. So it's quite a complicated thing, I think. That, yeah, that. but I think don't be sold on 4K. I understand that broadcasters are pushing it, but I don't think that's the reason you should buy a camera. You should be buying it for color and latitude and sensitivity and these <laughs> things, you know. And each thing has a different... If you're shooting night, then obviously you should be thinking about really high SOs. But if you're shooting in the middle of the day and all you're doing is like the desert in the middle of the day, the black magic is probably perfect, you know. It's extremely heavy. Well, <coughs> maybe not that one. The other one. <laughs> um, is there a reason why you didn't uh, include the Panasonic GH4? Did well, apparently it's here. Oh, you got one there. Okay. Um, well, I... <coughs> I don't really believe in micro four thirds either. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it depends on that thing if you want a cinematic image. Like you, you can put speed boosters on it and stuff to, to get it up to a point. And I haven't shot on this and I've heard good things, but I've also heard it, it clips really hard. So to me, that's one where I go, uh, you know. And I think like if you, if you kind of look at them apart from the cage that's on this one, they're very comparable cameras. Um, but in terms of what they what they again this thing you can tweak both of these cameras to to do what each other does largely, um, but they're incredibly different cameras out of the box. Um, um, like th this in S log is giving the, these really um, flat but filmic kind of images to color grade, whereas that's set up out of the box to give you what's closer to a graded image, a finished image. So what you lose there is a bit of latitude in the highlights, for example, um, but what you, you gain is a finished looking image straight out of the camera. So it depends on what your priorities are there Does, as well. And um, can I just say, it's not, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a comprehensive display of cameras here tonight and, um, and, the, and the C500 is still um, an exceptional camera. So, um, I mean, it, it's the flagship of the, um, of the, of the C range. Um, I've just got a quick question about the A7S. How do you find the viewfinder on the A7S? I mean, you, you look at Ari since they've released the Alexa, they've, they've had very uh, well built mm. EVFs. The um, FS7 or the A7S? Sorry, on the FS7. FS7. Um, and you look at Sony's F55, for example, and that has an incredible EVF. Yeah. How do you find? The, uh, FS7 sits kind of between those two cameras. Obviously, it's not the same as the OLED on the F55. Um, <coughs> it's not bad though. Like it's um, with the it's like the um, FS700 where you've got a, a flip-out screen essentially, and then the um, the viewfinder attachment goes on there, um, and that does give you, it's a pretty big, clear picture to work with. Um, not quite as much, um, not quite as much contrast as the the OLED, um, and um, not you know it's. There were moments where I was going, oh, is it in? Is it out? Um, mm. But on the whole, it's pretty good. It was it was better than I was expecting, and, and as is the the viewfinder on this as that well. That's really good. quite nice. Yeah, that's OLED, isn't it? That is OLED, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Just on the on the sort of filmic look of the sort of A7S and the F7, um, have you worked much with like the F5 and 55? Because mm. I, I find Sony to be kind of uh, very sharp and sort of video looking. Mm. Do you find that these cameras are a bit more filmic? Uh, it depends on how you have them set up. Yeah, well, I find it's if you know how to grade it, you can make Sony look. Yeah. Pretty good. The, the, that was something we were just discussing before about. So the F55 and F. Is it F5 as well? You changed the... So this is obviously a pre-production model and we don't know exactly 
how it's going to be in the end. But with those higher end cameras, if you want to do high speed, uh, they run into issues of uh, moray, which is like you get color banding and stuff. You get weird rainbow colors in fine patterns. Um, and so you have to change this internal filter, uh, which is apparently a $900 filter. And this camera, I believe you can't. So it'll be interesting to see in the end if there's those same issues. Um, but I did hear that you can use the 2K filter in an F55 to give you a softer image. Mm. But that's something that we didn't really touch on is the high speed thing as well, that this will do 120 frames a second. I haven't shot on it. I've heard it's a little bit soft. I haven't done much. Uh, this is the A7S. Uh, yeah, yeah. At 720, so it drops down resolution, but it'll do 60 frames, which is still pretty good um, at 1080 full quality. I think from what I understand is that when you go to a higher frame rate, the amount of information stays the same, but you're getting double the frame. So probably your quality is dropping to half, but your resolution is the same, if that makes sense. So it's 50 megabits a second at 25. It's also 50 megabits a second at 50. So it's, yeah, you're not getting any more uh, extra detail in there. Again, this is probably going to be a poor representation of the camera because it's a Vimeo clip. But the, this is the other clip from the yeah, Alexa. So, um, so this is the film called? Uh, this is Tausaru. So Tausaru. Ukraine is on a brothel screened at Venice and this one screened in Cannes. What's a lens, lenses did you um, have? Most of those are master primes. Mm. So this is something that talking about softening camera that we shot master primes in that and I was actually quite unhappy about how sharp the image was. And the master primes are notorious for being really sharp. Mm. And so now I just don't want to shoot master primes. I will shoot something like old Zeiss super speeds or something. The super speeds are making such a big comeback, aren't they? It's just, it's just because the cameras are so sharp mm. and I, I just don't understand why, like I understand it's like a selling point for manufacturers, but they've got to get that we, it's, it's just, anyway, it's not cinematic, it's TV, you know, that's what it is. So, um, yeah, so that was on Master Primes and we shot one zoom lens, which was that, mm. that, which was a really old, I don't know, I don't even know what it was, like a, quite a long old lens. Um, yeah, but so that f that film would not have looked the same on a lot of these cameras because the dynamic range in that is the the Alexa debatably has the highest dynamic range, um, and so there's there's shots in that that 
that really, really helped in terms of pulling up, co uh, reducing contrast and a few things like that when you've got really bright sun and you don't have a chance to fill in the shadows. And so it's like the shadows are really dark and the sun's really bright and you can kind of stretch that out. And so it doesn't look like crunchy video, it looks cinematic. Just from the, uh, the high-end cameras, let's say Ari Red and the 55, which seem to be the three yep. main yep. cameras there, um, you've focused on, well, you haven't focused, but you've talked about why you wouldn't use a Red. But the 55 I haven't known too much about, and we've heard a lot about the Alexa. Now, was that shot on this Alexa or the XT? Um, no, that was shot on, I think it was just a classic. Like, it was a pretty basic, the... Um, I've shot one thing on the Amira. I, I think you guys wanted to talk to me about that. The, the ironic thing is the Amir is quite a lightweight documentary camera and the, sh the one shoot I did on the Amira was all tripod and I had a camera assistant. I didn't touch the camera. So, um, but it is, it physically you can see that it's a lot skinnier. There's a lot less weight on it. Um, the ergonomics are meant to be better. The, the interesting thing is depending on if you're on a production or if you're on documentary, and I can imagine that would be amazing for documentary because all your buttons are there. If you're on a production, it's kind of annoying because your camera assistant, anytime you want to change a setting, you have to step back from the camera as he walks around and pushes buttons. And so uh, we were just talking about the old Alexas and now you can buy them for about 45 grand. And that'll give you pretty much everything that will, that will actually give you more than what that'll give you. Most of them have high speed licenses on them. And so I know he probably doesn't want me to say this, but um, you can probably buy basically a cheaper Alexa, which you also have the ability to do raw out of. You've got, the other thing we didn't talk about is considerations in terms of what you put on it. Mm -hmm. So your meter is very expensive on something like the Alexa, you know, uh, the um, a mirror is got cheaper media, you know, so, I think it's like a grand or two grand per card on an Alexa and you, you, you're probably getting like double the data for that price, you know, on an Amira. And, you know, stuff like VLOC batteries, the 500 bucks a battery if you're getting good batteries and, you know, and then when your camera is heavier, you're getting bigger tripods and you're looking at, you know, five, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for a tripod, um, you know, and then if you're going PL mount lenses, you know, the cheapest ones are kind of like the Canon lenses and stuff like that. But, you know, these lenses, uh, you know, you start, like if you're going to buy them new, you're sort of starting at 30 grand and then you're going up to $250,000 for a set of cooks. And would you, you know. use those sorts of lenses on that sort of camera? Or do you think uh, well, actually, the Amira, the Amira does have interchangeable lens mounts. So you can do Canon, blah, blah, blah. That's something that's really great about the FS7 as well. And this is my curiosity in the FS7 is that you can pretty much stick any lens you want on that thing. So um, the, the FS7 has the same lens mount as this, the E mount. Okay. Um, and and because it's such a shallow um, back focus um, area, um, that you can put adapters onto just about anything. The other thing that's quite interesting is, do you guys know what a speed booster is? A Metabone speed booster. It changes, just in case you don't. Uh, so the 5D got really popular because it had that full frame photography look. So you had more shallow depth than something like uh, the cinema cameras. Um, and so the FS7, you can put the speed booster on it, which gives you that same sort of 5D focus, um, which is an interesting option and might soften the image a bit as well, which would make me happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Has, um, has anyone sort of come up with uh, any advantages of utilising the speed booster on the A7S with its APS-C crop mode, or do you feel that just using the standard Metabones adapter is, I mean, obviously you can have that resolution loss. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted a softer picture, that would be a, a viable way to do it. I, um, I believe it reduces the rolling shutter. Yeah. Yeah. So if... Oh, yeah, sorry, because Sean? Yeah, yep. um, if you want to shoot at 120 frames per second uh, on the A7S, mm -hmm. um, it will crop to an APS-C size capture area. So using the speed boost for that awesome. would be <coughs> the lady in the full frame look. Okay. Um, also, someone else might be able to answer this question. I've heard that shooting at 50 or 60 frames a second, um, it line skips. As it, 
Yeah, pins, so okay, so pins. At, um, at the higher frame Whereas rates. it doesn't on the 720. That That's right, right yeah. So yeah. 25 frames per second, yep. it um, does full raster capture, so yep. there's, there's no line skipping, there's no mini. Okay. There's no line skipping on the A7S. Okay, cool. um, at 50 and 60 frames per second, it will be, okay. um, which means there's the possibility of mile, that's pretty mild. Yep. Um, it also <coughs> slightly reduces the effect of rolling shutter. Okay. Thank you very much. Does the FS7 do you know if it, it is it giving you full? It's full, it's full, full frame high speed. Yeah. Full HD frame. Mm. Cool. cool. And then the raw yeah, does. On 60, on 60 hertz basis. Raw, raw is meant to do 240, is that correct? So, but the raw record is going to cost more as well. <coughs> the raw record is probably going to, solution probably will cost you similar to the cost of the camera. Okay, so like 15 I mean, the way I look at it is raw, <coughs> I like to think the camera's are versatile. And if you, you talk to you about maybe using raw for certain things, but you wouldn't use it for your, your entire production. Yeah. Um, the fact that you can put raw on the camera, connect to a raw recorder, maybe a, a rental raw recorder or whatever, is, is, is nice. If you're going to shoot raw all the time, probably it's worth thinking about something like an F5 or an F55, yep. which has a, it's very, a very neat, dockable, yeah, yeah. um, fully integrated raw yeah. recorder on the back of it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to mention that um, at this session last year, um, everybody was uh, the talk of the of the whole session was really dominated by the by the C three hundred, which had just been um, um, used on a shoot that uh, Madeline, Madeline Heatherton did um, on the Mercy ships in Africa, and um, and Pete DeVries, um had um, been using them a lot and also. Um, um, Nicola Daly. So the um, um, it was it was um, extremely um, favourably like it was just being used on a lot of productions at that time. I just wonder, Paul, if you can just give us a little bit of um, information about um, the C five hundred, the kinds of people who are working with it at the moment. Sorry. The, the, the kind the kinds of productions or shoots that are, um, the C five hundred is being used on because it, it's it's a much higher spec camera. Yeah. Um, so it's a smaller market. Well, essentially, it's a it is a C three hundred in terms of its um, architecture, sensor, and so forth. Um, I've got to say, it hasn't been overly popular in Australia in the documentary market. Uh, mm -hmm. Has been on so, which one is this? The C five hundred. So it's it's been <coughs> really used from the point of locally that from the people I've been working with on high end cinema, you know, features mm -hmm. um, mainly within. You know, the, the people I work with, and probably the same within the, in the you know, UK and the States and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, the benefits over the C300, I mean, you'll get a rent, you, you will out of the C300 from this model, um, you're getting a, a full raw output in, in 4 and 2K, mm -hmm. uh, up to 120p. So, I heard, I guess we've heard the guys talk about the benefits and the I guess the, the downside of raw is mammoth amounts of data, and that is correct. When you're recording with the C500 in RAW, it, there's no compression. It's basically, you know, RGB layers coming out, four layers coming out in, in mammoth amounts of data. But the, you know, I guess what that gives you in the quality stakes is very high. Um, you've got the closest thing you can to what is a, you know, a, you know, the film piece of film that you would have had originally. So it, it, it gives you a very high quality file. But you know, you're talking. I think for every two hours, it's about a terabyte of data uh, once you've debayed the file and the software and so forth. Um, that, but you can shoot 2K, 4K, you know, up to 120p from this camera. Now, out of that, obviously, you've got your ISO. You've got all the things, I guess, that the 5D offered you um, when it first arrived on the scene in 2008. That camera has been around a long time, guys. The 5D Mark II wow. was released in October 2008. So, yes, obviously, I, there's been some criticisms about where it sits today, but let's face it, it really changed the, 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 the way we think about video many, many years ago. So, our competitors, yes, have mainly done, have maybe, maybe done some nice things in that time frame, but. You know, it is six or seven years down the track, so... And if I could just throw in there, um, you know, a lot of people still love shooting with the, the 5Ds, the 2Ds. I was and shooting on it today. <coughs> um, and and the, way, the way I look at the C300 and C500, in a sense, is they're, um, they're like, 
if you if you love the five D, um, it, it's most of what you love about the five D, but with the a lot of the video issues sorted out, like audio and um, and um, uh, like that that um, uh, chopped off highlights and shadows issue because it's got the Canon log built into it, like the Sony S log. A um, little bit different flavor, but um, it still gives you a lot of latitude for color grading. So it's kind of, it's, they come with a lot of those problems solved. And, and something that we've done, which is a little bit unique in the marketplace, is within the raw recordings from the 500, we bake in our ISO and our white balance. So if you're shooting at uh, 3200 ISO, that's what you're shooting at, at pixel level. It's mm -hmm. not basically produced or, or uh, rendered in the software up to 3200 from the from the base ISO of 800, that's what you're recording at. Now that you know Canon CMOS sensor technology has been so popular and, and worked so well in, um, in low light because of that technology going on for many generations now. So we believe we've got a true advantage within the Canon optics sensor processor. What, what IS, what's the base ISO on that? 850. 850. But you've got 12 stops all the way across up to you know, 80,000 mostly. In it, it keeps the top and yeah. oh, it's impressive. Mm. So, I mean, in that package, you know, for a C500, yes, you do, do need an external recorder to do all the raw recording that we talked about. But you're still looking, you know, combined with, with say, the obviously the, the 7Q, you're still looking at a sub $25,000 package with all, for all that. So it's, it's a very good um, price point. That'd be mid-range. Yeah. <laughs> mid <-range. laughs> um, Stefan, uh, we were talking earlier about um, uh, the way that you actually work with uh, work with manufacturers, um, all of them. I wonder if you'd just like to um, amplify that a little. Yeah, maybe I'll uh, tell you a little bit about that. Um, Ari is probably um, quite an old company. We are close to 100 years very soon. Uh, with a huge uh, background in filmmaking, and many people still forget that film was always 4K, 35mm, uh, uh, was easily capable of capturing 4K, and film was easily capturing one gigabyte a second without mm -hmm. even questioning it. Uh, what's really new is capturing 4K on digital imaging devices, and uh, I'm quite happy with the Sony approach that it's not all about the resolution. And I also like Erica's trying it because any sensor, and it doesn't matter whether it's Canon or Sony or Panasonic, uh, Blackmagic or ARRI, it's about the composition of the image. And the composition of the image, this is one of many factors is resolution, dynamic range, low noise, generic representation of skin tones, exposure latitude, and of course uh, sensitivity, but also the maximum frame rate you can achieve. And if you can achieve all of that at a good price point, with a small form factor, at a camera which has um, universal capturing devices, such as we use SPS cards from Sony, for example, on the Alexa, and also the display in our the mirror viewfinder is manufactured by Sony. Uh, the other way around, uh, many Sony cameras run with ARRI lenses or size lenses. Um, it, it doesn't help you if you focus on a certain manufacturer, it's just about we manufacture tools for you, not toys. Tools, you need them for <coughs> money making, for professional use. They are built to last. And uh, most important, it's not about weight, it's also about ergonomics. How does the camera sit on your shoulder? How reliable is the post production path? And uh, I like the comment made by our professionals here. It's like a well exposed nag in the past, where the colorist put it on the telecine or on the film scale and started grading. Now you have a well exposed or well-prepared RAW or ProRes or Sony, whatever, file, and you start grading. And when you're on, on set, you shouldn't focus on menus and setup. You do your framing and your focus, because this is what you can't fix in post. And the camera should do everything else for you. The camera is a tool to support you, and not the other way around. Um, also, uh, what we do quite well and for many years is also an accessorized camera. So we also build cage systems, bridge plates, base plates, matte boxes, follow focus for Canon. So we always know what camera is hot because suddenly we sell a lot of kits for the F55 or for the C300 or the 70s and you know actually that is the flavor of the month because everybody now wants a 
mini MacBooks 2 to fit on his uh, 5D or 7D or C C300. Um, but this is to make the camera more versatile, um, to really work in the hard environment. And the hard environment is not here in a studio floor, uh, it's out in the desert where there is no Wi-Fi for software upgrades, where there is no screwdriver or clean room to do any sensor cleaning. This is the reality and this is where the cameras have to last. And this is when you see what falls apart in the shoot and what's doing well. This is uh, what makes it worse that it's a little bit more expensive, but it's also your return on investment because um, you're the one to deliver the best footage you're shooting. And never forget, it's all about storytelling and filmmaking, and this is also what I tell students when we're teaching here in class. It's not about pixel talk and 10 bit versus 8 bit, it's about the impression of the final image you see on the big screen, and we just provide the tools for that. And we, we partner with, with all the manufacturers. Uh, this was always my um, I would say my secret of success to do cooperation rather than competition as we work with, with Canon, so we do, uh, okay this is a Fujinon lens but we also do the same with the Canon, they have a fantastic uh, 17 to 120 PL mount soon, um, we package this with, with Sony or Sony customers come to us for accessories like net boxes and photo focus systems and uh, at one set, all manufacturers meet anyway. And like today, we all sit in the same row. Yeah? <laughs> but this, this, this makes it work. And sometimes you're ahead with your camera, okay, then it's also a matter of flavor by the customer. Sometimes you have to talk customers out of it. They want to shoot raw, and I ask them, what's your deliverable? Yeah, it's IPTV. I said, well, you want to shoot raw, yeah, because it's just cool. <laughs> raw. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense technically, because you have to step back a little bit and look at your whole manufacturing chain from acquisition, post production, distribution. What's your deliverable? Is it Blu ray, IPTV? Is it the big screen, uh, uh, 2K DCP? Or is it broadcast? And every step in between is as important. And also, this also applies technically. And sometimes customers say, we should it all in 4K, or we should all just stay consistent. And uh, it was also mentioned, speak to your post house before you start shooting. Um, because it makes sense to think through the entire production chain uh, before you go on set. Uh, but, pick, mm, yes? Please. Yeah, I was just going to um, throw in there. I think there's, there's two really key things that you said there, Stefan Munnen is the um the consistency um whether you whatever aspect of this you're talking about um that uh, the consistency of your exposures the consistency of the camera setup um and the consistency of the the post path on a project i think can have as big an impact on the end result as any one element of that so you might um be uh, be able to go to a, a higher spec camera um, but if you lose that consistency within a project, it can often be detrimental. Um, so, um, and there was something else, but I've forgotten. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear your opinion on red. So far, it hasn't got a very good rap tonight, and we all know that. Uh, um, I, I basically can't say anything bad about red, and I never say anything bad about other manufacturers. Um, when I started in Australia in 2007, um, we sold a lot of accessories for red cameras because they had a camera body, but nothing else. And I still remember Videocraft, um, they had a big bunch of red cameras and they bought accessories from us for more than $100,000 just to accessorize the cameras to make them ready for set. And we also had red cameras in with customers at our test base because they only did lenses, so we had red cameras shooting with master prime lenses, they got RE map boxes and follow focus systems. And you have to respect with technology, and this was a very good comment from Canon. Sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Mm. And this is just a matter of technology, but also different requirements in different countries or for different target audience, whether you shoot for cinematography or documentary or for um, music videos. Um, it's, it's never a good finger pointing, and for the time the red camera was introduced, it was a fantastic piece of equipment because it really it, changed the landscape. It really changed, changed yeah. around the way of thinking yeah. Yeah. and it also helped to make the transition from film to digital because it somehow triggered all manufacturers to, to rethink digital mm -hmm. filmmaking. I think it forced everybody to make it affordable because you did have the Genesis and stuff like that but no one could afford one and then Red came out with this camera that everybody else went oh we have to match that now. Like I, I have think, a huge yeah. respect for the company, but 
as as a camera for me, I don't like the colours. And well, that's you mentioned the uh, the skin tones. Have you played with the dragon at all with the new? Um, no. I talked to someone in a rental house who uh, was very negative about the dragon. Um, but it's it's a personal view. Like if you own a red or you operate a red and you like those colors, that's great. Like I'm not telling you that the Alexa has the best colors for everybody. It has the best colors for me or Canon. I like the skin tones, you know, this thing, as, as you said, that you prefer Sony skin tones. And I think that's the thing that you have to look at the image and go, this is what I want. It's a legitimate and thing. Yeah. And also it's about your project. If you want a really cold look, like they, they say now that these cameras are almost like film stocks. You pick up a camera depending on the project and the look you want. You know, if everybody shoots red when it, well, now that there's other 4K cameras out, not so much, but everybody was shooting red and the Epic and stuff when it came to visual effects because they really needed that high res frame. And so, um, you know, even some, some Alexa shoots, they were shooting red visual effects plates, you know, because they wanted the, the, the higher output. So uh, I, I'm not, maybe I am dissing red personally, but... I think you have to go out and make your own decision. You know, you have yeah. to, and I have seen beautiful red stuff, but I haven't been able to get that result. I've shot stuff and I've been disappointed in it. And then maybe it's because of the colorist or something, you know, it's, but that's what's skewed my opinion. If, if I can just partially echo that, but also I, th I think the, um, uh, so yes, there is an element of subjective um, taste as in what, taste of image you like um, but also the the red has a particular way of working um, where um, just things like the way that the uh, the resolution and um, sensor crop are kind of linked to each other in the red um, it can be a great thing um, depending on how you want to work um, but it's something that for me personally I, I just find my I struggle to think that way, um, and and I, I do shoot with red, and um, and have had results that I've been very pleased with from the Epic, particularly. Um, um, but I think it's it's more kind of um, process and functionality stuff that um, I can work with, but is not as comfortable um, for me. I guess probably being so familiar with some of the other cameras. Does that make any sense? If I was looking for something with less saturation, uh, like a DSAT look or a black and white thing, I, I would totally check out the red because um, I've seen desaturated films. What is it? That uh, Acilium, mm. or Acilium, whatever it was. That was shot on the red and that looked great, you know. Um, but I've also seen even like the Facebook movie. There was... Uh, no, that's Matt Damon, I think. The one where they go up and anyway, um, <laughs> wasn't that great a film, but um, that it looks great because it was playing to the camera's capabilities. Like the, the I don't think the camera produces colors that well, <coughs> but if you want a desat look, who cares? You know, like that's not what you're after. You're after a desaturated look, and I've seen stuff. Um, I think Fincher shoots a lot on red, and like he he did these Gap commercials that look stunning. Like, and I yeah, I haven't seen it. Um, when I saw Social Network, there's a thing that I don't, I don't know if it's I've even noticed it a little bit in the Alexa. There's a thing that bugs me that film used to do fluorescence really beautifully, like fluorescent light and sort of really underlit stuff and. Even the Alexa doesn't pick up the colors that great, but the red really bugs me when it comes to that. There's a specific green spike that happens with those lights that, anyway, and I just noticed that in social network and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, if that had been shot on film, it would have looked great. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just look at it from a technical point of view because um, the same physical and optical limitations apply to any manufacturer. And when you look at this from an engineering point of view, we all use CMOS camera sensors, which use a Bayer pattern. They are single sensor, large sensor cameras. Um, what RED tries to do is they get 4 or 5K out of a 35 mil sensor, which means all the photosites get smaller, which means uh, basically the uh, 
light sensitivity goes down because you have a smaller area, which means you need more gain to get the same ISO, which increases your noise floor, and you have trouble with your color separation. This is why I come back to the Sony approach where they say, forget about pixel talk, let's make the photosites larger so we accumulate more photons to have a better signal to noise, we need to apply less gain to get the same sensitivity. Basically, when you go up to 5 or 6K, you need much larger sensors in terms of physical dimensions, which require larger lenses. Think back to 65mm film cameras, but this is now coming up again with 65mm uh, digital sensors. Then you combine the best of both worlds, then you have the same color separation because the sensor or the individual photosite area is similar to a 2K or 4K camera, but you have a wider sensor, therefore you have a higher resolution. This is the right thing to do. You can't do everything at the same time. The same is like, uh, there are also cameras out there which are specialized for high speed, like Wise Cam or Phantom Flex. And then a customer tells me, yeah, this color uh, rendition, this camera doesn't really do good on skin tones at 50 frames. I said, this is not, <laughs> this camera is not built for that. This is why you say uh, the Porsche is not good when you go uphill because it hasn't got uh, a four, four gear low ratio. I said, this car is built for high speed going straight. Yeah. Uh, also, if it might have the same horsepower like uh, Toyota Prado, but it's a completely different application. And I always come back to this triangle and to see what is this camera optimized for. Uh, of course, you can shoot uh, documentary with a DSLR, but this is um, maybe from the ergonomics. So then you ask about battery lifetime and storage capacity of your capture device, uh, price range, uh, versatility. I think I think that's a big thing is price range. Like it's good to talk about all of these, but like Kitty's film we got to a point where she said we're going to eat carrots and pasta because we don't have any money, you know. And we didn't have a second tripod. We would stack whoever's house we were st st in, stack their books, and stick the camera on there, you know. And so that's not any of these cameras' price range. That's a five D because she'd bought it previously, you know. Um, and that's that's the thing. It's horses for courses. You know, if you got a lot of money and or you're getting a lot of consistent work and you can justify paying off an expensive camera, you're going to get an expensive camera. Um, yeah, like it's it it is kind of nice to dream about the all the technical aspects, but the reality is you've got to pay for it. 